Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99. Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Episode 62. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you. All right, so uh, this evening, as I alluded, we're going to lead off with a lady poet. Uh, Her pen name was just simply H.D., her given name and the name, as far as I'm aware, that she used in polite society was Hilda Doolittle. You know, like Dr. Doolittle, but Hilda. So I'll tell you a little bit about the American poet whose pen name was H.D. And I, I love that phrase, the American poet. I think it's probably because Jim Morrison so ingrained that phrase into my head as uh, in my formative years, but he had died well before I was born. Hilda Doolittle, the American poet, was an imagist in the modernist movement of the early 20th century. She was also a translator, a novelist, playwright, a Self-proclaimed pagan mystic. This is uh, not too far after the days that you could be burned at the stake for this sort of thing. Her work as a writer is best understood when placed in the context of other important modernists, many of whom she knew intimately, and all of whom she read avidly, especially poets like T.S. Eliot, you know, the cat's guy, Uh, William Butler Yeats, William Carlos Williams, Marianne Moore, Wallace Stevens, and uh, Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound was Miss H.D.'s first love. So a lot of those, those folks, those characters, those poets have been featured here on Fireside Tales, as a matter of fact. Uh, yes, um, no, 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 well after, uh, 1490, uh, yeah, I, I predate all of them. Uh, HD's life, as well as her work, are the essence of the central themes of literary modernism. This was the time when people and writing styles wanted to get away from the norms and confinements of the Victorian age. Society had gone through rapid rapid technological change and the violence of two world wars at this point. Literary styles reflected the disintegration of traditional modes and the quest for new meanings. H.D.'s poetry reflected a woman's perspective on love and war, birth and death. During this tumultuous period which culminated in the Atomic Age. From Hilda Doolittle's book, published in 1921, called Hymen, this poem is called Leda, where the slow river meets the tide. A red swan lifts red wings and darker beak, and underneath the purple down of his soft breast, uncurls his coral feet through the deep purple of the dying heat of sun and mist. The level ray of sunbeam has caressed the lily with dark breast and flecked with richer gold its golden crest where the slow lifting of the tide floats into the river and slowly drifts among the reeds and lifts the yellow flags. He floats 
where tide and river meet. Ah, kingly kiss, no more regrets nor old deep memories to mar the bliss where the low sedge is thick, the gold daily, the gold daylily outspreads and rests beneath soft fluttering of red swan wings and the warm quivering of the red swan's breast. By H.D., this poem is called Song. You were as gold as the half-ripe grain that merges to gold again, as white as the white rain that beats through the half-opened flowers of the great flower tufts, thick on the black limbs of an Ilian apple ball. Can honey distill such fragrance as your bright hair? For your face is as fair as rain, yet as rain that lies clear on white honeycomb leads radiance to the white wax, so your hair on your brow casts light for a shadow. By Hilda Doolittle, who just wrote under the nom de plume HD. This poem is called The Whole White World. The whole white world is ours, and the world purple with rose bays, bays, bush on bush, group, thicket, hedge and tree, dark islands in a sea of gray-green olive or wild white olive cut with the sudden cypress shafts and clusters two or three, or with one slender single cypress tree slid from the hill as crumbling snow peaks slide, citron on citron fill the valley, and delight waits till our spirits tire of forest, grove, and bush, and purple flower of the laurel tree, yet not one wearies, joined as each to each in happiness complete with bush and flower. Ours is the wind breath at the hot noon hour. Ours is the bee's soft belly and the blush of the rose petal lifted of the flower. So, um, Hilda Doolittle, see Lily, read, slashed and torn, but doubly rich, such great heads as yours drift upon temple steps, but you were shattered in the wind, Myrtle bark is flecked from you, scales are dashed from your stem. Sand cuts your petal, froze it with hard edge like flint on a bright stone. Yet, though the whole wind slash at your bark, you are lifted up. I, though it hiss to cover you with froth. From the book Sea Garden, published in 1916 by H.D., this poem is called The Wind Sleepers. Whiter than the crust left by the tide, we are stung by the hurled sand and the broken shells. We no longer sleep in the wind, we awoke and fled through the city gate. Tear. Tear us an altar. Tug at the cliff boulders. Pile them with the rough stones. We no longer sleep in the wind. Propitiate us. Chant in a wail that never halts. 
pace a circle and pay tribute with a song when the roar of a dropped wave breaks into it? Poor, meted works of seahawks and gulls and seabirds that cried discords. This is, of course, part three of the installment of Unstable Geniuses, a novella written by my paterfamilias, Neil Ackerman. So, before we launch into part three of Unstable Geniuses, we need to rehash a part two. <clears throat> so the um, Unstable Geniuses, chapters 7 through 10, part 2, is as follows. Word spread quickly once it was revealed that Vladimir Frisbee, the guy that talks like this, was the winner of the $10 million lottery prize. The notoriety... <coughs> The notoriety brought him many offers, including a guest appearance on Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine, Jimmy B. Sunshine's television show, uh, plus investment advice from the hedge fund manager, Damien Hyde, and finally, a chance to earn additional cash by assisting Admiral F.U. Nagomo to spirit $15 million out of Nagomo's native country of Nigeria. Yep. He got a Nigerian prince email. Vladimir said no to the Nigeria deal and instead introduced Admiral Nagomo to his incarcerated nephew, Kermit Plaid, who viewed the offer as a great opportunity. Once Plaid was re released from prison, he headed to Chicago, intending to work with his newfound benefactor and to earn his cut, which would amount to 20% of $15 million. No Nigerian prince has ever, or Nigerian admiral, has of course ever emailed someone with malignant intention. Vladimir's farcical appearance on uh, Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine's television show revealed that both Reverend Jimmy and his sister, Melba Jean, were money-grubbing swindlers who, amongst other things, begged their listeners to buy them a personalized jet, which they intended to name Flying Jesus. One of Vladimir's problems was that he did not actually purchase the winning ticket. He only found it on the dead body of park ranger Dale Chumley. Chumley had taunted his own ex-wife, Wilma, by texting her a message saying that she would get no part of his winnings. In a photograph form, of course. Wilma's brother, Harley, Harley, confronted Dale, and a struggle ensued, which resulted in Chumley's death. A few weeks prior to Chumley's unfortunate demise, several people had witnessed Vladimir threaten to kill Chumley, which placed the innocent Vladimir Frisbee in the vulnerable position of prime suspect. And that is where we pick up with part three and chapter 11, entitled, An Accord is Reached. Someone posted Vladimir's Evangelical Lutheran Beat interview on YouTube, and it quickly went viral. As unlikely as it may seem, Vladimir Frisbee became a national sensation. Consequently, he was in high demand. Giving several radio interviews and making an appearance on NBC's Late Night with Seth Meyers, 
which the old man used as a bully pulpit to rail against Presbyterians, park rangers, and Hindus, saying that he read on the internet that the Grand Canyon had hired a Hindu park ranger. Frisbee also added, that's why we made Donald Trump president, so shit like this wouldn't happen. After appearing on Seth Meyers' show, Vladimir spent every subsequent night in the Red Dog Saloon telling patrons about the famous people that he met while taping in New York City, except he called it the Big Apple and assumed other airs as well. It was on one such occasion that Harley Dinkelman, carrying a full pitcher of beer, approached Vladimir's table. Placing the pitcher in front of Vladimir secured the old man's attention, and the king of Flagstaff invited Harley to pull up a chair. Soon, they were reminiscing about the times they'd spent together locked up in the Coconino County Jail, about the people they'd met, the druggies, the mean ones, and the crazies, but mostly about a particular jailer they nicknamed Sexy Jill, who used to unbutton her top and flirt with some of the inmates. It was then that Dinkelman asked Vladimir for his cell phone number, saying that he had a picture that he was sure that the old man would find interesting. Frisbee thinking the photo might have something to do with Sexy Jill, gladly recited his number, which Harley added to his contacts. Getting up from the table after noting the time, Harley excused himself, saying, Hey, sorry, I gotta run. I'll send you that pic later. We'll talk. Okay. Vladimir flashed a thumbs up and refilled his glass from Harley's pitcher. The next day, Frisbee, feeling the effects of last night's alcohol, rolled out of bed at noon. He stumbled into the bathroom, took a piss, and then made his way to the kitchen, where, much to his chagrin, he discovered that not only was he out of beer, but that along with a scattering of mouse droppings, only two moldy slices of bread remained in the bread drawer. Deciding that it was time to restock, Frisbee dressed, got his keys, and after five minutes of searching, found his cell phone. About to leave, he noticed that he had a text. Remembering Harley Dinkelman and tales of sexy Jill, Vladimir sat down to look at the message. At first, he was not certain what he was seeing. A person's face full frame with a piece of paper, chin level, and there was a message. Take a look, bitch. Ten million bucks. Too bad you don't get any of it. It hit him like 220 volts delivered to his groin. Dale Chumley's face and the paper... The ten million dollar winner. Harley knows. Vladimir Frisbee did not go to the Red Dog Saloon that night. He stayed home, paced the floor, wrung his hands, and finally texted Dinkelman, We gotta meet. Harley texted back, Right, but it has to be in public. They agreed to meet the next morning in a small diner on North Humphrey Street. When Frisbee showed up, there was Harley in a booth toward the back, except he was not alone. Sitting across from him was a woman, perhaps in her late twenties, and to Vladimir, she looked mean. Harley stood. Vlad, I want you to meet my sister, Wilma. She's a widow of sorts. Her late ex-husband, you might remember him. Dale Chumley. 
You two had business together, I think. You beat him with a boat oar and threatened to kill him. Frisbee awkwardly extended his hand and stammered, Um, yeah, yeah, er, uh, <clears throat> nice to meet you. Glaring, Wilma said nothing and ignored the attempted handshake. For the first time in his life, Frisbee began to feel sorry for former park ranger Dale Chumley. Just a glimmer of sympathy, nothing more. Harley continued, also, I believe you took something of his. A piece of paper with numbers on it. Vladimir, having turned a ghostly white, slid in next to Harley and said in a voice that cracked, um, <clears throat> okay, what, um, what, uh, what do you want? Half. Vladimir Frisbee began to do something which was rather foreign to him. Tell the truth. It's not ten million. The government left me with 6.3 and I spent 300,000 on a houseboat. The rest is invested. Vlad, why don't you go to the restroom? Come back in five minutes. Wilma and I have to talk. The old man left, and the siblings whispered. She argued, he countered, but eventually they came to an accord. When Vladimir returned, Harley spelled out their terms. Okay. Keep your boat, but we want to see proof. Also, where did you invest the six million? I put all of it in the Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund. I'll show you everything I got. All Vlad's financial records checked out. Harley said he wanted nothing for himself and that the three million would be signed over to Wilma. After some research, the ex-Miss Chumley said, Let her ride! Electing to open a Lutheran hedge fund account, and she had Vladimir transfer her three million into it. Chapter 12 Orlando Bud, nicknamed the Boss, Orlando Bud was a quiet giant, six foot ten, and strong as an ox. He played on Harley Dinkelman's rugby team, the Lions. After games, when team members would meet at the Red Dog Saloon, Orlando would not join them. Instead, he would return home with his wife and his son who was terminally ill and who needed round-the-clock care. Expected to live only to see his first birthday, young Alex Budd had surprised everyone by reaching the age of three. The doctors said that two things were responsible. A medication called 10 hexatin taken twice daily, and the Lions rugby team. Dressed in a lion costume, Alex became team mascot and would roar with every score. Alex had lion posters, lion pajamas, lion toys, and his parents would tell him that he had the strength of the king of the African savanna. One day, Alex Budd told his father, if I'm a lion... You should be one, too. But I, I am. I, I play for the Lions. Yes, but you don't look like one. Alex looked sad and turned to stare out the window. Orlando had a friend. 
a member of the Flagstaff furry community. The friend regularly attended furry conventions and had lots of contacts in furrydom. Through him, the bus had a costume made. A lion. Nothing expensive. You know, brown. A mane. Paw gloves, paw shoes, and, and, and no tail. Don't want it caught in my cycle spokes. One day he surprised his son. Roar! Ten hexaton cost five dollars per pill. And two pills per day, even without insurance. The cost was quite manageable, but as Alex grew older, he required four per day. Then, for reasons no one could explain, the price per pill rocketed to $700. The buds struggled, sacrificed essentials, cut doses, maxed out credit cards, sold the motorcycle, eventually declared bankruptcy. Alex died before reaching his fourth birthday and was buried in his lion outfit. All of the lions attended the funeral. The strain was too much. The grief was too deep. The buds divorced. Orlando, a mechanic, lost his job, quit rugby, and took to drink. Harley tried to intervene, but nothing worked. Some said that Orlando became a little nuts, wearing his lion costume while sitting on his front porch, beer in hand, empties piling up around him. Chapter 13. The News Hits Hard. Two months after Vladimir Frisbee transferred $3 million into William Chumley's Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund account, Wilma telephoned her brother, Harley Dingleman. She seemed rather upset. Harley, turn on C-SPAN right now! Twenty minutes later, Harley called his friend Orlando Budd. Orlando, turn on C-SPAN. You're really going to want to hear this, buddy. He then returned to the television, spellbound by testimony during a Senate hearing. Melba Jean Sunshine had fixed herself a Long Island iced tea, then had begun channel surfing her 85-inch, $15,000 flat screen. She stopped in her tracks when something caught her eye. Moments later, she called her brother, Jimmy B., with essentially the same message. Jimmy, this is a f***ing catastrophe. Turn on C-SPAN right now. The B does not stand for Bible. According to his birth certificate, his given name is James, James Benjamin Schultz. Vladimir Frisbee's wife, while shopping for a new television, stared open-mouthed at the screen of a live broadcast. She then scrambled for the phone in her purse. She went to favorites, poked Vlad's number, and left this message. Vladimir, you won't believe this. Turn to C-SPAN as soon as you can. Using the computers of the Flagstaff Public Library, Frisbee had switched his phone to silent. He was preoccupied, attempting to reconcile the difference between two letters he had received from the Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund. One letter, addressed to all investors, touted the hefty second quarter returns while pointing to a glorious future. The second letter, addressed only to him, warned Vladimir that his account balance had dipped below the required $10,000 minimum and that he had 10 days to correct the situation or his account would be closed and the remainder would be returned to him minus fees. The last time he had checked his balance, 
it was three million one hundred sixteen thousand dollars five hundred eighty three and growing. The following is a transcript of C-SPAN broadcast of a Senate hearing. The Senate hearing is entitled, The Committee for Consumer Protection and Financial Oversight, a.k.a. the Committee to Weed Out Corporate Sleaze. Hearing in Progress. Chairman Dobbs. Senator Sneed, you, sir, have the floor. Attorney for Damien Hyde. Um, Mr. Chairman, clearly Senator Sneed is uh, compromised. Not only is he a, a Lutheran, but he <clears throat> also him, uh, himself is an investor in the Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund and therefore must recuse himself. Senator Sneed acquiesced. That's fine. I yield my time to Senator Woolbright. Chairman Dobbs continued. Senator Woolbright, you have ten minutes, sir. You may begin. Sneed, not realizing that his mic is live, leans to his left and whispers to a neighbor, Okay, Woolbright, kick that weaselly little ass. Not Senator Sneed's first misstep involving a hot mic giving to heavy drinking. Sneed committed political suicide when previously asked if he was pro-life. The drunken senator joked, I was until my mistress got pregnant. Subsequently, the senator announced that he would finish his current term but not run for re-election. Back to real time, Chairman Dobbs, Senator Sneed, please, your mic is still on, sir. <laughs> My bad. Sorry. Senator Woolbright, please begin, sir. Ah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, Mr. Hyde, you purchased the rights to the, to the medication tin hexaton in 2017, did you not? Hyde, smirking while leaning into the mic. On the advice of counsel, I refuse to answer the question on the grounds that it might incriminate me. According to our figures, the cost of producing a single tablet of tin hexaton is 97 cents. Is that correct, Mr. Hyde? Damien Hyde's smirk apparently is a permanent facial feature, for it remains in place for the duration. On advice of my counsel, Senator, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it might incriminate me. Mr. Hyde, in January of 2017, prior to your acquisition of the product, Tin Hexaton, cost the patient approximately $5 per pill. Is that right, sir? On the advice of my counsel, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it might incriminate me, sir. Why is it, Mr. Hyde, that after your company, Jolly Roger Pharmaceuticals, of which you are Chief Executive Officer, why is it that you raised the price to $700 per pill, sir? On the advice of my counsel, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it might incriminate me. Is it true, as CEO of Jolly Roger Pharmaceuticals, that in 2016 you paid yourself a salary of 900000 and in 2018 your salary jumped to $19 million annually? Mr. Hyde, please answer the question, sir. 
on the advice of my counsel, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it may incriminate me. My time is limited, so we shall turn to another matter. Is it correct that you are the owner and manager of the Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund, sir? On the advice of counsel, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it might incriminate me. Recently, both Barron's and the Wall Street Journal described your fund as, I quote, little better than a Ponzi scheme. Is that correct, Mr. Hyde? On the advice of my counsel, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it might intimidate me, incriminate me. Isn't it a fact, Mr. Hyde, that your fund is just a confidence game which preys on the innocence of gullible Lutherans, sir? On the advice of my counsel, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it might incriminate me, sir. Wilbright, holding up two documents. I have here both a financial statement provided to us by your company and an audit report done by an independent agency, whereas your company statement claims your fund has total assets in the amount of $3.7 billion. The audit report shows that your fund's bottom line is zero. A great stirring erupts in the Senate chamber, punctuated by several loud gasps. Where is the money, Mr. Hyde? Damien Hyde took the fifth because he adhered firmly to the maxim that a closed mouth gathers no feet. And if, when pushed into a corner, he would cling to the three Trumpian principles, deny, lie, and deflect. Later that day, Damien Hyde boarded his new private jet a Gulfstream G600, and flew nonstop Washington, D.C. to Phoenix, Arizona, traveling 600 nautical miles per hour, and in the process did not bless any of the millions of peons residing 30,000 feet below. Had he been present, Vladimir Frisbee would have been relieved to learn that no angels had been harmed during the 1,979-mile journey. The following day, Damien Hyde's smirking image was front page. And the headline read, Damien Hyde, Most Hated Man in America. Chapter 14, The Most Hated Man in America. It was true. The Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund was a Ponzi scheme, and most of the $3 billion was secreted away in offshore accounts. As expected, a mixed bag of press, paparazzi, and protesters lay in wait for Damien Hyde at Phoenix's Sky Harbor Airport. Plus, he knew for certain that the U.S. Marshal Service would be knocking on his door with a warrant for his arrest. Best to avoid everyone for the time being. He had the foresight to call the Phoenix office of Jolly Roger Pharmaceuticals and set up a plan to evade them all. His longtime friend and co-conspirator, D. Bentley Brown shared many things in common with him. Height, weight, 
age, complexion. Before Hyde's arrival, Bentley rented a room and paid for two weeks up front. Upon Hyde's jet touching down, the co-conspirator took up a position in an airport restroom stall. With two security guards blocking the entrance, Damien occupied the adjoining stall. There, they exchanged cell phones, shirts, and jackets. Hyde also gave Brown the magazine that he used when leaving the G-600 to cover his face when surrounded by news-hungry mob. Bentley, in turn, supplied his boss with wig, hat, dark sunglasses, and a hotel room keycard. Ten minutes after the exchange, while covering his face with the magazine, the imposter emerged from the restroom. The two security guards ran interference as Bentley pushed through the crowd to a limousine with Jolly Roger Pharmaceuticals emblazoned on the side. Five minutes after that, Damien walked nonchalantly out of the restroom and used Bentley's phone to call an Uber. Waiting for him in his Hyatt Regency hotel room were two weeks worth of clothes, a computer, three different newspapers, two bottles of Dom Perignon, his drink of choice, and a large box with the word shark displayed prominently on the top. Three hours later, and having emptied both champagne bottles, Damien sat alone, contemplating his future. The week had been a disaster. He had a deck of cards and half-heartedly practiced sleight of hand. It had been a long time since he had last dealt three-card Monty, and he had grown rusty. His attorney said prison was a virtual certainty, and he could face seven to fifteen years if found guilty. The most hated man in America joked when he heard the possible sentence, Just hope I get a room with a view. It was a feeble attempt to boost his confidence, and was the first time in a long time that he did not precede and follow a statement with a smirk. But... Mr. Hyde had no intention of seeing the inside of a federal facility, good view or otherwise. Bentley had connections. In two weeks, Damien would have a new passport and a new identity. He had narrowed his future home choices to either Croatia or Ukraine. Two nations with no extradition treaty with the United States. He had never been to either, but with the information he gathered from the internet at the moment, he leaned toward Croatia. Damien Hyde was a furry. Whether he felt alone or needed bolstering, he would don his $10,000 shark costume. He had chosen, as his alter ego, the great white shark, the most feared predator in the ocean. He cut a strange image shuffling his deck of cards while sitting alone in his shark outfit, a shark that could be described as buff, something that Damien was decidedly not. Pudgy and rounded accurately captured Mr. Hyde's physique. Mr. Hyde was born a crook. The eventual CEO of Jolly Rogers, Jolly Roger Pharmaceuticals Natural Inclinations came out early in life. In grade school, his favorite swindle was the aforementioned three-card Monty, and he received great satisfaction from winning lunch money from starving classmates. As he grew older and bolder, his cons grew both more elaborate and more lucrative. In many ways, 
he was a genius. He entered college at 16, and because his business classes were boring, and his poorly paid teachers were just that, poorly paid, he felt superior. Money was the yardstick he used to measure people's character. College was easy for him. To pass the time, he worked a con on the side. This he considered as a hobby, but a hobby that paid well. His most successful was his version of the classic Spanish prisoner. He posed as a 23-year-old woman living outside the USA and found a photo on the internet that matched what he had in mind. Beautiful. Short. Exactly the kind of woman that turned him on. She was doing commercials for a Chicago BMW dealer, and he could not stop looking at her image. Well, if I'm in love with this one, the others will be too. He had cast a wide net by sending out hundreds of emails using addresses he had purchased on the dark web. Her real name was Lydia Bunn King. But that would not do, so he changed it to something more sexy. Hi, my name is Candy Apple. I live in Scotland, but I love America, and my dream is to live there someday soon. Would you like me to stay with you? Send me a pic, let's talk. Love and kisses. From Scotland, Candy. For weeks he would get no response, but when one came through, he'd pour it on thick. Escalating each exchange after one month, love and kisses would become soft porn. If porn would turn into an invitation to fly to the United States, Candy would claim that she had saved up enough to buy a ticket and would give her victim times and a flight number. But just when her mark began anticipating consummating their online relationship, she would come up with a sob story. My money has been stolen. No, I can't be with you unless, and I hate to ask you, you could see it in your heart to loan me the money for airfare. Well, then... Half the time the money would arrive, and if it did, in the next email, Candy would ask for more. Some said Damien Hyde was too smart for his own good. He did know this, as long as there was no shortage of stupid people, he would always have a steady income. Hyde loved gorgeous women. And he learned early that in the, t in the eyes of some women, big money had a way of erasing both personal and physical defects. On that score alone, Damien Hyde was all in, and down deep, he realized that a large fortune would be required to cover up his many imperfections. Two weeks, two damn weeks I gotta spend in this hellhole, Damien said to himself as he sat alone in the Hyatt's penthouse suite overlooking the Phoenix evening skyline. If word got out where he was staying, an arrest would be made. And it was the distinct possibility that he would be held without bail. Boredom weighed upon him, and he found it oppressive. To pass the time, he sent out a few hundred candy apple emails, but not even one lousy nibble. FurCon Phoenix was the following weekend, the largest furry convention in the American West. He'd never missed the event, and this, the 10th anniversary, was sure to be a bash to remember, one that he was loath 
to miss. Finally, he caved. Damien called D. Bentley Brown and asked for help. Together, they hatched a low-key plan involving Bentley and a convention center employee. Fur fun, fur con phoenix, here I come. Definitely a time to celebrate with an eye toward bringing a woman, or maybe two women, back to his suite. He instructed Bentley to buy him two cases of Don Perignon. Chapter 15. Class Action Lawsuit. 24 hours after Damien Hyde's Senate hearing, Vladimir Frisbee received a special delivery letter from the law firm of Cockburn, Drexler, and Storm, informing him that, as an injured party, he was invited to a meeting in Phoenix to discuss filing a class action lawsuit against the Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund, Damien Hyde, fund manager. The letter went on to name the date, place, and time. Frisbee checked his calendar. Great. I'm free that day. Harley Dinkelman's sister, Wilma, had also received the invitation, but because of work, she asked if her brother could go in her place. Since he, at the time, was between jobs, he said, Yeah, sure. Be glad to. Next, Harley called Frisbee to see what he thought of the matter. They talked for 45 minutes and ultimately arranged to drive together. Vlad and Harley were the first to arrive at the meeting hosted by the Phoenix lawyers, and they sat in the back. Soon, people started strolling in, and the auditorium began to fill. Frisbee found himself people-watching, guessing from the way they walked and how they dressed, just how much they had invested. Two people, a man and a woman, caught caught Vladimir's eye. They were overdressed. He wore a tailored suit. She, a fur stole. Plus, they attempted to conceal their identities. Dark glasses and hats pulled low over their eyes. Vladimir nudged Harley. Eh. Get a load of those two. Harley stared and then said, They look kind of familiar, don't you think? Furtively looking to the left and to the right, the newcomers eventually found two seats directly in front of Vlad and Harley. As he approached his seat, the man suddenly covered his face with his hand. It was almost as if he had recognized Vladimir Frisbee. Once they'd settled, Vladimir leaned forward tapped the man on the shoulder and asked, Say, don't I know you? The man turned and answered in a whisper, Mr. Frisbee, please, let's talk in private after the meeting, sir. Vladimir Frisbee signaled, Okay. He leaned back and whispered in Dinkelman's ear, it's Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine and his sister, Melba Jean. Then he said more to himself than to a Harley. Yeah. I really don't think the B stands for Bible. Well, I'm really happy that we have such a large turnout. Mm hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. The voice over the microphone brought the crowd to attention. Vladimir sat up straight and looked to the man on stage. My name is Napoleon Storm, and I want to welcome you all to the Phoenix. Immediately, a man in front jumped to his feet. Mr. Storm, Mr. Storm, can, can you get us our money back? Um, well, yes. Yes, that is our intention, of, of course. But, but, but how, how much of it? It's been our experience in cases like this that 
you can ex expect 10 cents on the dollar, 20 if you're lucky. A collective moan erupted from the audience. Vladimir leans to Harley. F that shit. Meanwhile, Reverend Jimmy whispered to Melba Jean, 10 cents on the dollar with that? We can't even buy Cessna Citation Jet M2. Might as well keep the one we have. Someone up front, can you see to it that the b spends the rest of his life in jail? Well, now that, that, sir, is a matter for criminal court. What will, what we, together, what we will be filing is a civil action. Several hands popped up, but Mr. Storm, who was eager to conduct business, waved people to sit. Ladies, ladies, gentlemen, please, please, we will entertain questions later. Right now, I want to introduce to you the fiercest litigator west of the Mississippi around the office. We call him Pitbull. Here he is, Mr. Cosmo Cockburn. A man stepped forward, stern, no nonsense, a scowl on his face. In the audience, many unsuccessful attempts were made to suppress giggles. Despite that, Cockburn stood ramrod straight and completely unfazed. Vlad to Harley, yeah, my burned after my last trip to Mexico. <laughs> I guess if your name's Cockburn, you get used to getting laughed at, right? Harley turned toward Vladimir and whispered, yeah, probably makes you mean too. Just then, Vladimir's thought turned to the sinking of the Nostromo, and he remembered what being laughed at was like. Yeah, I'll bet it does. The meeting continued with lots of legal ease, but the $20 words caused Vladimir Frisbee to drift off until he was awakened by a commotion behind him. Two gentlemen entered the room, a short squat man, partially eclipsed by a large, stately black man, wearing a military-style uniform. So sorry. Please continue. Our plane was late, you see. The tall, regal black man said apologetically in refined English, with a slight British accent. As the men walked down the center aisle, only then did Vladimir clearly see the second person. That's, that, that's Kermit. Kermit Vlad, Vladimir said loudly. Frisbee stood and made room for the two to sit beside him. He had a thousand questions for his nephew, but because of the shushing aimed at him, he chose to hold off for the moment. Once seated, Kermit leaned forward and whispered to his uncle, Um, Uncle Vladimir, I would like you to meet Farid Uzoma Nugomo, Admiral in the Nigerian Navy. Vladimir's mouth dropped open. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. You can view more of my work at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Produced by GWC Productions. In memory of Wolfgang Beastly. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99.